Dan Abrahams. Welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Hey, Erica, this is a long time coming. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for the invite. I am so happy you're here. And it was great meeting you at the coaches convention a few months ago. And we we finally got connected after following each other for so long online. And I've been meaning to get you on the show. And I believe you're the second sports psychologist to come on. And I'm getting a lot of requests from parents and players to dive more into the mental side of the game. So it, this is going to be a great conversation. And I want people to get an idea of what types of athletes you work with. I know you work with very high level, but you have a very diverse palette of clients. So without giving too much away, I know there's some confidentiality uh, issues, mm. but give everyone an idea of who you've worked with and who you're working with right now. Well, thank you so much, Erica. I mean, I, I, I've been in high performance sport now for 26 years. I'm getting old, clearly. Um, and initially, I was actually a competitor to myself. I was a professional golfer. I didn't win any money whatsoever, whatsoever, largely because of what was going on between my two ears. And then I started to coach the game. So I have a playing and coaching background, which is always useful as a, as a sports psychologist. And I've been a fully qualified and registered sports psychologist here in the UK, but working globally for the last 18 years. And I, I always I look, I work across all sports, but I always say that I specialize in two, golf and football. Golf, because clearly I know it like the back of my hand. I played the sport and I've been lead psychologist for England golf. I was that for, for, for three or four years and I've worked with golfers on both sides of, of the Atlantic and, and across the world. Uh, football is in soccer, yeah. um, and um, I suppose that's really where I've done most of my work. Um, I've held contracts with about half a dozen Premier League clubs here in England. I've worked across Europe with the teams, clubs, and individual players and coaches. I do a lot in America, actually. Um, uh, I have my own online academy where I've supported. I think last year, last fall, we supported twenty-five. Uh, college programs with mental skills, a number of clubs, a number of high schools. Um, and I've always, we met at the convention for the first time at the beginning of this year. And I always come over every year for that. And um, uh, I, I work in other sports. I've probably worked in every single sport. I've been, again, lead psychologist for England rugby. Uh, and um, oh, what else? What else? I do quite a bit in esports. I've written four books, one golf three soccer um and uh, a couple of years ago very kindly gareth bale the now former soccer player welsh soccer player um came out and very kind he said that um, soccer tough my first book changed his life um i'm not sure it changed his life that was him being very nice but uh i'm pleased he enjoyed the book so look i mean m my passion is to demystify the the, the psychological side of uh, sport for parents, for coaches, and obviously for, for players. So I think that brings me to today. I currently work with Feyenoord in the Dutch leagues. Uh, they just won the Eredivisie, the Dutch championship, holding off the mighty Ajax and PSV. I currently am consultant psychologist for um, Formula One, the Aston Martin Formula One team, um, and I have a, a range of, of clients. So I, I'm busy, busy, which is which is good when you're a consultant. I love that Gareth Bill said that your book changed his life and it is an amazing book and and we're going to talk about it. I have so many questions but uh Dan's book Soccer Tough I've read and I encourage everyone to check that out. Now Dan I'm curious if you've seen a, a difference in 2023 as opposed to even several years ago. So in the youth space there seems to be this emergence of young athletes now going more to sports psychologists. It used to be more, oh, just professional athletes and adult athletes need sports psychologists because they deal with so much pressure and the overwhelm of their schedule. But now you're starting to see youth get into more the mental side. Can you just touch on why it is important in today's soccer climate? 
Yeah, well, let me start by saying I do think we've had an increase, and I think um, I think in part increases knowledge. There's a, there's there's a broader and a deeper knowledge of the psychological side of sport, largely because of the proliferation of information on the internet. You know, there's so much now. You can Google, you can go on YouTube, and people like myself are talking about the importance of of, of psych. So there's now an understanding of where you know, psychology, um, how psychology can be integrated into the process of physically building an athlete and and, and tactically and technically uh, developing uh, an athlete, a, a soccer player or any other sport, if you like. So I think people are starting to understand where it fits in. And I also think that people are, under, are starting to understand that you know, this can start, you can start to work on these areas in a very simple way, in a fun way as well, for very uh, young uh, participants of, in sport. Um, you can do that, for, you know, early. You really, really can. And, you know, often that's delivered by coaches on the grass or on the court or on the course. And I think they're often the best people to deliver, especially at very young ages. Um, but, you know, now I, I, I do plenty of sessions with young teenagers, again, as long as it's delivered in a safe and healthy and fun way. And by safe and healthy, it's obviously as a young teenager, it is, you know, every young teenager has ambitions. I know I did as a golfer. I wanted to be a professional golfer from quite young. Um, but as long as it's not taken too seriously. And it's it's understood that these are being introduced as a way to develop oneself in sports, potentially to develop oneself in life, and to broaden one's experiences within sport. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. So I think it's more information out there. We understand more about it. And it's understood that sports psychologists not only can help improve the experiences of, of athletes in their sports uh, environments, but also engagement. You know, we can't. We don't just help players get better, um, as in learn uh, better, more eff effectively and efficiently. We help them perform better, potentially. We also help them enjoy their engagement in their sport. Lots of people are experiencing that that now from working with people like myself. So I think I think it's just that knock on snowball effect, Erica, more than anything else. So you mentioned the work you've done with teenagers and putting it in a fun and simple way. What are some of the things or activities you're doing with them to get them started with a, a sound mental training program? Yeah, well, look, um, I, I always love answering a question like this because I immediately go to, as I said earlier, my, my passion is to demystify. When I, when I got started as a psychologist, I drew from my experiences in golf and I had some great experiences in golf, working with sports psychologists and reading really good books. But I, and I always felt, I still think I can do this really well. I'm not saying I can do it better, but I, th I think I can do this really well, whereby I create these really tools, simple tools and techniques that are still drawn from the psychological theory, you know, the kind of research papers that nobody outside of psychology wants to read. But I'm going to draw from that and I'm going to make some fun ideas, some fun techniques that are still impactful and powerful. Now, one of those techniques is a technique I call a game face, a game face. And I think actually, if you Google my name, Dan Abrahams, and you, and you put game, uh, game face in, I come up quite a bit because I talk about this a lot. And a game face, as the name suggests, is your optimal mental state or your best mental state it's like your competitive persona it's like a guide for your attitude an attitudinal guide so i help players to create a game face and i'll give you an example of a game face to to bring this alive so i happen to work with uh, somebody who might be considered one of the best defenders in the world right now and I also work with, and obviously we're talking soccer here, we're talking football. Um, I also work with somebody who might be considered one of the best strikers in the world right now. I'm very blessed to get to work with some really good players. Now, what I know from my work with that defender and that striker is the defender, every time that defender walks onto the pitch, that defender is thinking, 
I'm going to be dominant and relentless. I'm going to be dominant and relentless nonstop. Nothing and no one takes me away from dominant and relentless. Every run, every movement, every action, dominant and relentless. If I make a mistake, I get back to dominant and relentless. If I give the ball away, dominant and relentless. If we go a goal down, dominant and relentless. If we go a goal up, dominant and relentless. The striker is thinking, I'm going to be confident, upbeat, lion. Confident, upbeat, lion, nonstop. I'm going to be a lion in that penalty area. It's my penalty area. I'm in charge. I'm in control. I'm going to be confident. I'm going to have confident body language no matter what. And I'm going to stay upbeat. If I miss a chance to score, I'm going to stay upbeat. Confident, upbeat, lion. Dominant and relentless, confident, upbeat, lion. These are examples of game faces. How you create a game face is you start by thinking about you at your best. And this is why I love this technique, because I can immediately start having a positive conversation with someone. Well, tell me about you at your best. Tell me about your best game. Tell me about your dream game. Who do you want to be out there? How do you want to go about your game? And the beauty of this is you can play about with language and ideas. So what I tend to do is I ask players, and people listening in right now can do this, strip your best game back down into some action-based words, examples. Alert, alive, lively, relentless, cool, calm, relaxed, focused, upbeat, athletic. I'm sure you can think of lots of action-based words that resemble you at your best. So like that defender, one of the best defenders in the world, goes out, plays Premier League, plays Champions League. He picked dominant and relentless, dominant and relentless, because he said, Dan, those are the two words. When I think about everything I do when I'm at my best, those are the two words I latch on to. So the number one objective he has, no word of a lie, the number one objective he has is not to go and win, not to go and play really well. Of course he wants to win and of course he wants to play really well. But what he knows is if he's out there and he's focused on being dominant and relentless with everything that he does, his game face, those action-based words, that gives him his best chance to have his best possible performance and contribute to a team that may win. Similarly, that striker, confident, upbeat lion, can you see how we've got the confident and the upbeat? And sometimes I'll ask a player to pick a concept like an animal. I know it sounds a bit strange, but that's the way our brain works really well. It's a metaphor. It's like, oh, yeah, I can think of being a lion out there. I'm in charge. I'm a control. I'm the king of this pitch. Again, I know it sounds strange, but it really is how our brain best works. And this player, uh, this striker, very good player, one of the best around, said he had a bit of a chuckle about it, but he said, yeah, I love that idea about being a lion. So confident, upbeat, lion became his game face. I might ask a player to pick their a model player. So I've got a very good striker I work with who picked, I think it was something like relentless energy cane, as in Harry Kane, relentless energy cane. So that's how you create a game face. Action-based words, model players, concepts like animals drawn from your best games, your dream games, who you want to be out there, and you can have lots of fun with that. And it just strips things back to things that you can do out there no matter what. I love that. And it must be fun for youth players to think of those action-based words. I mean, there's so many fun ones. I was just thinking fast, electric, explosive. <laughs> and I'm sure that's just such a fun activity for players to really reflect on, okay, what am I good at? what is my role and what does my position require? And I think that's so cool. Now with the game face, you also mentioned body language as a part of it. So what are some things in terms of body language should players who want to step on the field confident be thinking about the moment their warm up starts for that game? Well, you know, it's really interesting because, um, I, body language is an interesting one because I think players in general, in my in my experience, and I, I and I, and I'll be as humble as I can here, I do find that players can tend to be uh, a victim of their body language rather than using their body as a weapon. Players don't always realise they can use their body as a weapon, and I think even the term body language, which I agree, it's a great term, but even then, it, I still think it's too vague. So I try to break that down even more. And uh, actually, in my my one of my books, Soccer Tough 2, which unsurprisingly was the sequel to Soccer Tough, um, that, that, that I, I talked about players having controllers on the pitch or uh, on the field of play, just like a PlayStation or Xbox controller. 
because I wanted I, I wanted to find a way for players to really understand self-regulation, self-control, or self-management. And I thought, hmm, you know, most young people today have um, a PlayStation or a PlayStation or an Xbox. They use a controller a lot. Well, have you considered this? That when you walk on a pitch, you have a couple of controllers. One of which is your body controller. Your body can be used as a controller to help take charge of yourself, to help take control of yourself. And really, when you break, break that down, if you think of the controller having six buttons, okay, four buttons on the front, two buttons on the top, you could actually think about six ways to use your body um, to be able to self-control and get on with the game or even get back to your game face. So let's think about what these buttons could be. One button could be your posture, how you hold yourself. So I can make a couple of mistakes, but choose to hold a posture that allows me to stay concentrated or focused, allows me to stay as confident as I can possibly be, in control as I can possibly be. So one button is your posture. Don't underestimate your posture. One of the quickest ways to attack your nervous system, to manage your nervous system, if you like, is through how you hold yourself, your posture. Another button could be breathing, taking some breaths. That's nothing new, nothing revolution, re revolutionary or even revelationary, right? But not a lot of players use that bre breath button or that breathing button when they need to. Just when you've got a bit of time, if you're starting to get anxious or stressed or worried or doubting or frustrated or angry or you're experiencing any such emotion that could be considered unhelpful in the moment, that's your time to breathe. And what we know now, there's something called heart var variability training, which is far too posh a term for what it really is, which is simply to breathe in for five seconds and out for five seconds, in for five seconds and out for five seconds and i appreciate you can't always use that especially when you're exhausted in the middle of the pitch but before a game that's really great to use that breathing button to settle those nerves maybe to reduce the volume of anxiety there's two button buttons i'll give you one more button and i would say that's your gestures button using positive gestures gesturing at others in helpful ways and what we can safely discern there is that when I gesture, when I use that gesture button, when I gesture, that's my body language, isn't it? I'm gesturing to help others, but I also help myself when I gesture. Again, that's what we know now. Again, I'm going to give you another funky term here as a psychologist, embodied cognition, embodied cognition, which in simple terms mean if we think of cognition is mental processes and embody, to embody your mental processes. Your mental processes are embodied. So as we move our body, we change our mental processes. So if, if I was to gesture positively, hold a great posture, combine the two, I've got a great chance of managing my mental processes. So breaking, there's more ways to break down your body language, but thinking of them as of a body as a controller, as a weapon to use, to help yourself engage in self-control, that's a really powerful way to look at it. Now, I'm curious your thought on players having positive thinking all the time. We see that a lot now in the, the mindset space. And there's a lot of, okay, you need to always be happy and thinking positively. And I'm curious your perspective on this and when those negative thoughts start to creep in, what players can do. I love this question, and um, I think you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, we we we've known each other for some time, although only just met, and, and follow each other's work. And I think you probably know I write quite a bit about this because I do get a bit frustrated about that when it comes to some of the messages uh, around positive thinking. And I'm not for one second going to sit here and suggest positive thinking is bad. Of course, it's not positive emotion brilliant is important and i want people to be as happy as they can possibly be and experience as much positive emotion as possible but to demonize negative emotion isn't a great uh position to come from because actually high performance if we're talking about performance um uh, should probably involve a degree of negative emotion 
um, and probably experiences throughout um, uh, talent development pathways and any experience for young players. I think we have to be realistic that, that, that um, if we are to suggest that sport is a microcosm of life and actually we engage in sport, yeah, for, for its sake in and of itself, because we want to play sport, but also because it can teach us lessons and because we can use what we learn in sport away from sport, then maybe we have to inject some negative emotion, appreciate negative emotion has to be involved in sport in some respects. And I would also suggest that anybody who says, well, it's all got to be positive and we've all got to love each other and we've all got to be happy every minute and misunderstands how we function as human beings. As I write about a lot, the reality is as human beings, if we think about our thoughts, emotions, feelings as our inner experiences, thoughts, emotions, feelings, from the very surface thoughts to the very deepest feelings, the reality is thoughts, emotions, feelings happen to us. We're going about our everyday life and we have a thought. We're going about our everyday life and something happens. We have a feeling in accordance to what's going on. And so the reality is not everything's not always going to go our own way. And the reality is the way we're designed as human beings, we have actually quite a negative brain. We have to because we have to scan for problems. We have to scan not just for opportunities, but for things that are going to endanger us. So as a consequence, we are born to notice negativity. We're born to experience negative thoughts, emotions, feelings. And I'm saying all of this, Erica, because I think that's where we have to position ourselves at the beginning to understand that no matter who this is, no matter how much skill we have in our hands or our feet, no matter how much we love the sport we're playing, we are going to have what could be considered negative or unhelpful or destructive thoughts, emotions, feelings. And that's okay. That's all right. That's allowed. Some people experience more than others. And some people experience uh, unhelpful negative thoughts uh, in different ways to others and it impacts who they are as a person that's okay we all have different personalities we can all get grumpy we can all be fearful we can all be anxious we can all get frustrated we can all doubt ourselves and worry and i can assure you as somebody who's blessed to work with the very best players in lots of sports in the game they have that as well some of them have more than others you know than than have more than players who aren't considered as good so this idea that we're all the very best in the world walk around without having negative thoughts, emotions, feelings is just not true. So that's the starting position is accept these are part of the human formula, that these are going to happen to us. They emerge. We experience them when we're playing, when we're training, when we're practicing. We experience them when we get up in the morning. But what we can do, so in many respects, controversial point, we can't really fully control our thoughts emotions feelings they happen to us but what we know from many years of research and experience is that with skills and competencies we can take control of thoughts emotions feelings there's a difference between control and take control my thoughts emotions feelings happen to me I might have an instant, instant response, anxiety, doubt, worry, fear, frustration, anger, lethargy, flatness, feeling down, dropping confidence. I might have an instant response, but then I can use my skills, my techniques, like a game face, like my body language or body control, to be able to manage those thoughts, emotions, feelings. My one last point here would be, I think what we would say, probably globally now, as a community of sports psychologists, is it's less about positive thinking, although we think that that is important. Of course it is. It's more about flexible thinking. Flexible thinking. Because, again, the reality is, if you're somebody who's passionate about your sport and you want to engage for a long time and you want to learn and you want to explore being the best that you can be, we can't just walk around the world going, well, I'm brilliant, I'm great, and my, my game's fantastic and I don't need to work on anything. We need to also be able to flex onto, well, what do I need to do better? What does need to go better? What am I not good enough at? That's not negative thinking. That's helpful 
constructive thinking in that moment that some people would construe as negative, but is a very important way. So we have to flex often. That's brilliant. And I kind of want to dive deeper into an example here. So say, for example, you have a forward who's in a very long playing rut. They just aren't finishing. They're shanking. They're not getting shots on target. What do they do step by step? So first they acknowledge that they're frustrated and they're making all these mistakes. Then what would be next from there to get out of that rut because so many youth players struggle with these at times. Yeah. You know, it's such a good example, Eric, and I'm having these conversations all the time. And I think it speaks to kind of what I've just described in many respects in terms of, I actually think acceptance is really important here. Acceptance of what's happening in your game, in your performances and acceptance of the challenge ahead and acceptance of the thoughts, emotions, and feelings that you're experiencing. I really do believe Eric, that it's okay for players to go, I accept that I'm going to have some negative thoughts right now. I, you know, sometimes I do say to athletes, you know, give yourself space and give yourself room to feel a bit frustrated with it right now. Clearly, we don't want that frustration to spill out with into the wrong behaviours, like giving up or getting angry with others or um, being a complete pain for your coach. I'm not suggesting that. But just in your own private time, just giving yourself to, some space to go, wow, man, this is just not where I want to be right now. I feel a little bit flat about that. I feel a bit frustrated and, uh, and down right now. That's okay. That really is okay, in my opinion. And I believe it would be in the opinion of quite a few psychologists. But then obviously, at some point, you've got to do something, right? You, you've, got, you've got to take some action. In many respects, you've got to turn down the volume of those negative uh, thoughts, emotions, feelings. And how do you do that? Well, it is about taking action. And if I may say so, I do think this is where utilizing things like the techniques like game face and body controller can be really, really useful. And that's really, those are the kind of things I can tend to direct athletes on because those are the things that are more controllable. Okay. Not everything is controllable, but these are more controllable, controllable than scoring. Because let me draw back a second here. Usually what you find in the given situation that you're speaking of here, of a forward or a striker, isn't scoring. What you can pretty much guarantee is that striker not only is feeling flattened down, and as I say, give them some space to feel flattened down, but they're thinking they're weaving an inner story, a narrative of I've got to score, I've got to score, I've got to score. I've really got to take my chances today. It'll be a disaster if I don't score again today. And they've kind of got this language that's very extreme. And they're putting a lot of pressure on themselves. And they're a little bit all or nothing. And that's where I come in and go, hey, relax. Oh, let's remove our inner story away from or redirect our attention away from Got to perform, got to perform, got to win, got to win, got to score, got to score, got to score. It will be a disaster if I don't score because I haven't scored and I'll be out the team. Let's start to change that story. Let's change that story onto, okay, what can I do? And so maybe the number one thing here might be, well, okay, what's your game face? Okay, well, it's, uh, it's confident, upbeat, Kane. It's confident, okay. So let's talk about what confident, upbeat, Kane would do here. And you can start to break that down. And that's the beauty of a game phase. You can start to break that down. Well, Harry Kane will be continuing to make the same runs. He'll be continuing to scan for space and look for tiny gaps in the defence. I've got that game face of, I don't know, confident, upbeat Kane. So I'm going to hold myself confident. I'm going to stay upbeat no matter what. That's going to be tough to do because I know in the back of my mind I want to score, but I'm going to turn down the volume of that those thoughts and turn up the volume of my self-talk around come on stay confident upbeat Kane stay confident upbeat Kane those little runs look for gaps get in behind the defenders when that chance comes shot away straight away if I miss back into position that's the kind of story built from game face or any other technique I have that I want players to start to have and the crucial thing for those listening in to recognize is one 
change the story, to change the story onto things that you can actually do. Uh, be action oriented. Be task focused. Focus on your tasks. Focus on being action oriented. Focus on what you can control and engage in those and see where you end up. And if you don't score again, you go again with the same things. You go again with the same things. You go again with the same things. All the while in training, keep having a conversation with your coach. Keep exploring what you can do better. Those, I think, um, are the building blocks of the kind of inner stories, inner narratives and approaches you need to take when going through a rut. You also talk a lot about visualization in your book. And so would this also be valuable for athletes to rehearse and kind of like pre-record these actions in their mind before that next competition? Yeah, you know what? I think it's a really good question. I do talk about visualization, visualization or mental rehearsal or imagery. There's a number of terms. And it's, it is important that the challenge with the term visualization is we think of, well, the visual sense, seeing it. And again, what we know from the science now is, you know, mentally rehearse everything, what you see, what you feel, what you hear, see it through your own eyes, see it from the side, um, feel the movements, the kinesthetic movements that you'd make, envision specific um, uh, parts of the game that you want to get right. Absolutely. I, I, I think that this is really, really useful. Which isn't to suggest, Erica, that there's not footballers out there who say, I mean, I think Lionel Messi is somebody on record as saying, I don't really think about the game before I play. I go out and I'm I'm constantly scanning and I'm looking for solutions and opportunities and I play the game that's in front of me. So I do think we have to be quite robust in saying everybody's a, a little bit different. But I, by and large, I think most people find it useful to image an upcoming game because what you're doing in simple terms is creating a blueprint, a blueprint of the actions you want to execute, the style in which you want to execute those actions, and a very effective way to use imagery or mental rehearsal or visualization is to think about the kind of challenges you're going to face and to rehearse in your mind, create a blueprint of how you're going to deal with those specific challenges. So if you know you're up against a big, strong defender as a, as a forward player, as a striker, you might start thinking about the movements you've got to make to lose that big, strong defender. You might think about spinning them out wide, drawing them in deep, you know, using your mobility, your dy dynamic mobility to be able to lose them. So I, I think that's effective without ignoring the fact that some don't love to do that. And I think the final thing to say here is don't think for one second that this has to be this really specific, awesome image you have in your mind's eye. It could be a general sense or general impression in your mind of what you want to do, the style in, you, in which you want to do it, how you're going to overcome your challenges. That's often enough. But creating that blueprint is a really effective way uh, to prepare to play. So I'm curious, you work with some of the best in the world. What would you say they possess in terms of mental qualities? Oh, really good question. And I, I you know what, I, I, I'm going to start that question by throwing you a curveball to begin with and say that, you know, there are definitely some players who are the very best in the world who probably get away with not a great mindset at times because they've got a lot of skill in their feet or a lot of skill in their hands. And I'm, and, and I, and I'm not suggesting that's great because I think they can be even better. But you'd know yourself as a physical trainer as well. Some are just so physically good. Some just get themselves around the pitch uh, or the court or the course so physically well that they can get away with some lapses of concentration, distraction, et cetera, et cetera. However, we're passionate about being the very best that we can be, which means I think everybody should explore this. Now, now, what are they? What do they tend to be really good at? Again, I'm going to say I do think it varies from individual to individual. I'm going to be a real psych, put my psychologist cap on and say it does depend because I think it varies. But I do think for everybody listening in, 
you do have to consider four big C's. Um, confidence, concentration, control, and commitment. Confidence, concentration, control, and commitment. There's other C's out there like communication and cohesion, but those four C's, if we're thinking about yourself as an individual, whether you play an individual sport or a team sport, those four C's, confidence, control, commitment, uh, and confidence, did I say that one? Um, those four, I think, if I think about the best in the world, usually they're the ones who are pretty high. It, you know, if we think about a game of FIFA on uh, Xbox or PlayStation, you think about the ratings, the skill ratings. And if you included those four, I really think the best in the world would be pretty high with the vast majority of those. They're confident and they they probably, uh, whether by design or not, they work on their confidence daily. They're, they're concentrating well. They're dealing with distractions quickly. They're engaging in control, self-control through all the kinds of things we've spoken about so far. And they're committed. Man, they're committed. You know, they're training hard. They're training with quality. They're doing the right things every day. They've got the right habits in place by and large. And so those are the four things to look at. And I would say those four things are what the very best tend to have quite filled up to the brim when it comes to that sort of cup of excellence, if you like. Dan, this was brilliant. And I know everyone listening found this super valuable and they're going to just take some action steps doing some of the drills that you recommended in the episode. So we would love your feedback in the comments. If you're trying any of these, if you've read Dan's book, I'm going to link that in the caption soccer talk one and two below. So check that out, but let us know how you're doing in your mental game. And Dan, where's the best place everyone can follow up with you or connect with you if they have questions. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for this. Eric. I really enjoyed it. And uh, look, the obvious place is my website, danabrahams.com, where you can find links to all my books, which are where you buy your books. Um, and you can I have my own podcast, The Sports Psych Show. I have um, and, and really social media. I have a lot of social media accounts, I must be honest. The obvious one um, is that uh, on Twitter, which is uh, Dan Abrahams 77, Dan Abrahams 77 brutally giving away my age um you can find me on linkedin you can find me on facebook uh, i have my own facebook page and that's uh, dan abrahams soccer instagram at dan abrahams sport uh, and there's a couple more twitter accounts but people will find me so uh, just thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation thank you dan this was super and everyone else i will see you on next week's episode